Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Howard Yermish, John Atwood, and Pat. Coming up on DTNS, should autonomous cars put the sensors alongside the road instead of in the car? Hmm. ByteDance takes on the MetaQuest worldwide. And is it inevitable that popular social platforms will just end up as a wasteland? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, September 22nd, 2022. Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Austin, Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Folks, we got some deep thoughts for you today. Hang around. But first, we must feed your brains with a few tech things you should know. The UK's Office of Communications, also known as Ofcom, will scrutinize the roles of Amazon, Google, and Microsoft in the cloud services market, noting it will take action if there's any competition concerns. The UK's cloud market is currently estimated at 15 billion pounds sterling, approximately $16.97 billion, with the three companies accounting for around 81% of revenue. Ofcom will also examine the messenger and smart device market, including WhatsApp, Zoom, and smart speakers. The regulator will begin the market study in the coming weeks. And thus begins the reign of King Charles III. App researcher Alessandro Paluzzi uh, has been leaking a lot of stuff lately. The most recent is an early screenshot of Instagram working on a tool to detect unsolicited nude photos on the social media platform. The idea would be to give users an option to either view the photo or not before they have to view the photo. You get to make your decision. Uh, Meta confirmed to The Verge that the feature is in development, so it's real. Meta said Instagram will not view the images themselves. It's not like somebody would be looking at them before uh, they share them uh, with third they won't they won't be sharing them with third parties either and we'll provide more details on the program in a few weeks ahead of testing DJI announced the Osmo Mobile 6, the latest model in its smartphone gimbal lineup designed to stabilize videos and photos taken with phones. But this model features a new wheel control to make zooming and focusing easier, and also a status panel to show the gimbal's battery life on the go. DJI also has a new feature called Quick Launch when using the gimbal with iPhones designed to generate a push notification to more easily launch the DJI camera app when it detects that a phone has been mounted. In a blog post Wednesday, Twitter says it discovered a bug that's been around for months uh, that would leave some accounts logged in on devices after a password reset. Twitter's password reset, like most password resets, is supposed to revoke all session tokens, but it wasn't doing that on mobile apps. Web sessions were closed appropriately, apparently, uh, and the bug has existed since last year. Twitter directly informed affected users and has proactively logged them out of all open sessions in order to just reset the whole thing. Google announced its Chromecast with Google TV HD coming with a remote so you don't need to use a smartphone to control it, although you could if you wanted to. It's oval shaped with HDMI and USB input. The remote also has a Google Assistant button, so that's easy for Google Assistant folks. Only does 1080p, albeit with HDR, but it also only costs $30. It's basically the 4K model without 4K for $20 less. Yeah, you wouldn't think people would be as excited about it as they seem, but a lot of people are... are $30! Yeah. 1080p! $30 Chromecast! Yeah! I got a remote! Amazing! <laughs> Uh, all right, let's talk about a VR headset that's taken on the Quest 2, Pico. Pico is a Chinese startup that ByteDance acquired last year. Uh, the parent company of TikTok uh, developed a new virtual reality headset, the Pico 4. Pico 4 is going to launch in several European and Asian countries for 429 euros. That's about $425. 128 gigabytes of storage. Pico 4 is smaller and lighter than a previous Pico Neo 3 Link that was put out in May. It weighs about 586 grams. Uses a Qualcomm Snapdragon XR2 processor, 8 gigs of memory, 2160 by 2160 display per eye, and they say you'll get three hours of use on a charge. Uh, they're going to put out the 128 gigabyte for 429 euros. Like I said, the 256 gigabyte version uh, comes for 499 euros. Pre-orders beginning September 23rd in a few countries. If you are in their system as an insider, uh, it'll start shipping mid-October in those countries. No plans to launch in North America, though... 
uh, there is an FCC filing for this. So no plans to launch in North America yet, but you are going to get it in Jap Japan and Korea, uh, most of Europe, and it's going to be coming to Singapore and Malaysia later this year and launching on September 26th for orders in China. So it's going to be curious to see what the new MetaQuest headset will come at uh, uh, price-wise, but this seems to be on on the the higher, higher. end. They're certainly yeah. not trying that was to. My first thought. Yeah, they're not trying to differentiate it on price per se, which means I assume that they believe that they can compete in terms of the product, which uh, I would be very very curious to say to see as a Quest user. Don't forget the MetaQuest Two just had a price rise, so it's four hundred ninety nine bucks now. Yeah, well, yeah, and that's what I'm. I'm curious as to what the what what the next edition is going to do. I I imagine it will not be cheaper than four ninety nine. So so this this might be competing on on price barely, but it certainly it certainly is not the slam dunk bargain. Unless I mean, there's a chance that the Quest comes in at seven hundred. Who knows? I mean, as somebody who is a Quest enthusiast, but also I play you know three VR apps regularly and i dabble in some others but you know i kind of i like what i like and 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 the ecosystem works for me what pico could offer somebody else you know i, I know it's not coming in north america right this second but let's say it did tomorrow and my first question would be like all right well what do i do it's not like enough to have like some cool VR headset that I could afford that's moderately comfortable on my face, <laughs> which which headsets are, you know, they're, they're just scraping by at this point. Anyway, it's it's what can we do, you know, yeah. with with these? And yeah, like what what are you tapping into here? What's the app store? What do I got? Well, yeah, I mean, but beyond the apps, I, I do think that you pointed out a few things that could very much be immediate differentiators. If if uh, the field of vision is wider, if the image is sharp. Sharper, if the headset itself is lighter that allows you to spend more time with it on your face, then I, I do think that uh, like from the second it came out of the box, you would immediately feel the difference. Yeah. Uh, do, the couple other things to note about this, it can connect to a PC and play Steam VR games, um, mm, just, you know, okay. which the Quest can also do stuff like that. Uh, and uh, there is going to be one with eye tracking called the Pico 4 Pro and a Pico 4 Enterprise coming later this year. Uh, but yeah, in the end, uh, the biggest advantage to this, because apples to apples, it feels like you're looking at two apples. Like uh, the, the, <laughs> this, is, this feels like the big advantage is it's not from Meta. Yes, uh, it is from uh, ByteDance. Which, it's from ByteDance, uh, which you, know, pick, you might have poison. other issues with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you like apple poison or apple poison? Uh, this hasn't been peer-reviewed yet, this next one, so take it with a grain of salt. But the approach is interesting, so I, I thought it was worth us bringing up. DeepMind has a chatbot called Sparrow uh, that was trained on a large language model, an LLM, called Chinchilla. Uh, but Sparrow is the name you need to keep in mind. That's the name of the chatbot. One of its main aims is to talk to and inform people without saying things that are false. Well, that's a good goal. Uh, without encouraging people to do harm to themselves or others. I'm, I'm behind it. Uh, and without just being downright offensive. So uh, those are the high goals of chatbots these days. Uh, instead of being trained on large amounts of human text, some of which is made by humans who exhibit those bad behaviors, Sparrow is trying to use Google search, some text training, and immediate feedback with humans to train this. So Justin, uh, how does this work? Tom, I'm so glad you asked. Sparrow does a search and presents multiple answers to a question with citations. It is prevented from giving financial advice, making threats, or claiming to be a person. Human participants then say whether they thought the answers were plausible and whether the chatbot provided sufficient evidence, uh, like links to sources. The chatbot learns from each interaction. It tests, uh, in tests, it gave well-supported plausible answers 78% of the time, and human participants got it to break the rules only 8% of the time. So I might be, you know, I, I feel like I interact with chatbots when maybe I'm you know, trying to talk to some customer service, you know, um, chatbot situation for a company. Maybe I've bought something, there's a discrepancy, that sort of thing. I've never had a chatbot 
be offensive to me or, you know, like encourage self-harm. I, I probably just haven't uh, encountered the right chatbots, but this <laughs> seems like a great idea. Sparrow is saying, yeah, yeah. let's make the chatbot not psychotic. But well, it's a fair point. The chatbots you're going to run out into in customer service situations are very locked down. Uh, and and sometimes you run into those limits. Uh, the chatbots that are offensive are the ones from other AI companies like DeepMind that have put been put out there. Like, hey, everybody, try our chatbot. One of the most famous was from Microsoft, you know, five or six years ago. Tay. The, yeah, Tay. Thank you. I couldn't remember the name. Uh, that just started insulting people and using racist language and stuff. Mm, so, yeah. in the, in these wider open, more capable chatbots, uh, that has been a problem in the past. Well, and and let's be clear. Those were examples of people actively trying to break the chatbot. Yes, they were. They were trying. They were maliciously trying to. We get assume it to, Sarah to get doesn't it do that with her customer get. service. Job. Yeah, really, I just want a refund. Uh, uh, That's yeah, all I for want. Anybody, I mean, I'm sure everybody who's listening to this certainly knows this. But if you have, if you encounter anybody in your life, chatbots are not just waiting on a hair trigger to turn into horrifyingly obnoxious racist monsters. If you are actively trying to either corrupt their model or exploit an element of their model that has these things in it, then you are going to find it. But but you have, but to, that, you have to go out of your But that way. said, you know, if that does happen, you go, hmm, well, this shouldn't happen again. The chatbot oh, needs yeah. to get better. Absolutely. Yeah, and that that's what they're trying to figure out, is how do we get the advantage of not controlling what the chatbot does? That's the whole thing with AI, is that, you know, we just train it, and then it does things, uh, but dissuade it. So they, they did a little bit of locking down, well, you just can't do these behaviors, although apparently people are able to trick them into breaking those rules, and then encouraging them to present more than one option and say, well, which one is the best so that I get better at presenting these options? Cite sources. I think that's an interesting way to go about this. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see if anything comes of that approach. Uh, my, my suspicion with this is that we are, we are going to find a computational solution to it before we have a human assisted uh, curation. Well, this is a computational so. Uh, thing. No, it's I, just using it's incorporating human feedback as, as, as part of its learning method, which uh, is, is not human oversight. No, no, no. Sorry. Yeah, I, I didn't I didn't mean to insinuate that. Yeah. Well, a company called Soul Robotics is developing an autonomous vehicle system that is not putting sensors in cars, but along towers on roads that those cars might be driving down and then broadcasting the data to the car, which only needs connectivity to be autonomous. So it would, I don't know, get a lot of pressure off of car makers, I suppose, if this works out well. Level five control tower has cameras and LIDAR and can connect to the cloud to process data and also send that data to the cars. The argument is that the system can know a lot more about what the safest path forward is for a vehicle than any single car can know, because it's got context, you know, because there's a lot of cars. And that data can be shared to the other cars on the road as well. The buzzwords associated with this would be ATI for autonomy through infrastructure and V2X, that's vehicle to everything communication. Yeah. It's possibly more efficient to do it this way, since you only need a few hundred sensors to automate all the cars passing by a tower. Uh, so if you're in a parking lot, uh, or on a factory where you're managing a fleet, uh, that could be really useful instead of having each car have to have its own set of sensors. But you'll have to get the car makers to cooperate if you're going to do this. Uh, so far, Soul Robotics has deployed its tech in automobile manufacturing facilities. So they're getting the car people on board that way. Uh, the BMW 7 Series has been equipped with this. Uh, BMW is deploying it to its uh, automate its last mile fleet logistics at their manufacturing facility in Munich. Uh, Soul Robotics says it's also working with Mercedes-Benz, uh, Qualcomm, Volvo, and LG Plus as well. Um, you also need the infrastructure to be set up if you want to use this outside of a limited area. Uh, and to that end, Soul Robotics is deploying sensors to detect vehicle and pedestrian traffic in parts of Asia, Europe, and the United States, uh, particularly here in California, Florida, and Tennessee. Right now, this is being pitched as a great way to gather data for governments, uh, you know, like pedestrian traffic, how many people are obeying the rules, where where are their problems in the flow of traffic, and for last mile fleet op automation, like we were talking about BMW do. It feels like a long shot that autonomous cars would come from infrastructure built along roads, 
instead of from within the cars. But hey, we, we had to build roads everywhere. So we did that part of the infrastructure. Who knows? I don't think that it's a crazy idea, uh, uh, specifically if we are in a world where you have a lot of self-driving cars that have the the sensors on the cars themselves. I could see the infrastructure being built around it, but I kind of feel like it will happen in that order if just because consumers and manufacturers will feel better with all the tech that could go wrong being in one place as opposed to a connection between uh, uh, the road and whatever state that is in with the car itself. Yeah, my first thought was, okay, if I expect you know autonomy as I'm driving, and let's say I'm driving down the 101 South, and you know between my house and getting to San Francisco, it's fully autonomous because we've got you know all this stuff. But then it isn't anymore because then I get onto surface streets and the whole thing changes. That might be sort of frustrating, but like you mentioned, Tom, this sounds like it makes the most sense for certain areas of road where there are a bunch of cars who are not gonna do particularly anything all that crazy. And and the data getting from just the flow of traffic, and again, pedestrian information, super helpful as well. That that's where that's where where this makes a lot more sense and also uh, takes the pressure off of the consumer to be like, all right, well, I have to have like, you know, the autonomous car and, you know, pay more for it myself. Yeah, the uh, I, I don't think this is going to end up being that it does feel like it's a it's a local enterprise level factory floor parking lot, maybe yeah. kind of thing. Uh, and it's cheap enough that you could put it in uh, autonomous cars that also have sensors just to make it cross compatible. Uh, if you were to think about this as like crazy future, maybe this is the way we get autonomous cars it would have to be like cell, cell phones, right? Like it would actually be easier to roll it out in urban areas on surface streets than it would be like to like build it out, uh, you know, across highways uh, and things like that. Uh, folks, if you want to join the conversation in our Discord, you can uh, trade some ideas about this as well. I link your Patreon account to Discord and we'll just show up like that. Patreon.com slash DTMS. <laughs> The Verge's Russell Brandom has an article called How Platforms Turn Boring. He's bemoaning the age-old complaint that when something gets popular, the things that make it special get watered down, and then it's not that cool anymore. He uses TikTok as an example, saying, quote, At first, TikTok was exciting because there was a culture that could only happen there. But now the actual content is getting closer to what you see on every other network. Brandom has a test for this. He calls it the bootleg ratio. So how much content is created by users specifically for a platform versus clout chasing accounts drafting off of the audience. So for example, Instagram used to have a unique hustle culture all its own. Brandom argues the culture has tipped toward reposting and become a place for distribution, not creation. As counterexamples, he puts forth Reddit and Twitter. They don't have as large of an audience as Facebook, but the audiences are stable and each has a very unique culture. And he acknowledges that the ratio can tip too far one way or another. In the cases of Vine and Tumblr that had unique niche cultures but struggled to say viable. He also points out that YouTube seems to actively fight for balance in the form of creator subsidies to encourage original content. Yeah, most recently with shorts, right? Uh, it's hard to see what you could do about this, though. If bootlegs or reposts or viral hogs, as Brandon variously refers to it, are a wasteland, then why do the user numbers rise? Uh, the money is going to follow users, uh, after all, which is why these wastelandish platforms are more successful. If the unique culture of Twitter or Tumblr is preferable, why aren't they succeeding? Uh, you know, is, is Brandon just making a more elaborate version of the argument that the band you like was cool before everybody else started to like them? Uh, or is he onto something where, where a balance of culture with virality, like he describes YouTube attempting, is the secret to avoiding the eventual decline that seems to come to every platform? You know, MySpace is still out there, but it's not much used and Friendster is long gone. I, is MySpace still out there? My goodness. It is, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I think it's a little early to say, like, ah, TikTok's over. It's lame now. Um, <laughs> I, I That said, 
I have definitely noticed, um, and Brandon makes the same claim in in this very thorough article that's worth reading, that uh, you know, for the for you page, for anybody who's familiar with TikTok, that's just kind of like, hey, we're gonna serve you stuff that you're gonna like based on what you've what you've liked and interacted with before. It it has definitely gone more what I would call that viral looking for clicks, hoping for some revenue type thing. And I don't think that that's, that is not unique to TikTok at all. Um, I see it everywhere. Um, Instagram's been, you know, plagued by this for years. But the, but the, the question of, well, so then why do more people end up, you know, going to that place? I think it's a couple of things. First of all, not everybody is just a first, you know, um, you know, it, <laughs> a first responder of sorts, you know, of the new, of the new social hotness. Like it's going to take a lot of people a while to sort of get there because they're going to hear about it enough and they're going to go check it out. Also, the stupid meme accounts that I still follow on Instagram that ha have become less and less interesting to me because I'm like, okay, I, I get what you're doing. I mean, they, they have the most engagement. That, that is, that is a way to make maybe not revenue for a long time, but revenue in the short term. So, the, you know, any social network that is buzzy, I don't know. I mean, be real. Look at that. But it's, why are they buzzy, right? Like that, that's the question is like, Brandon's it's buzzy trying because to say, I think be real is interesting right now because it has a real culture, but at some point, you know, the viral hogs will come for it and then it will be a vapid wasteland. But apparently when that happens, these platforms get more popular. They get more popular and then they kind of don't because you go, mm, I mean, it's not that interesting. It's but it takes a while for that same. to happen. Look at Facebook. It does. It does yeah. take a while. And I think I think that's that's kind of, you know, to the heart of what we're talking about is, all right, well, if there is an ebb and flow to all social networks, uh, what you know, I, what, whatever the... I don't know, you know, you know, what, whatever your unique thing is that you say, well, we're different than the other social networks and here's why people are always going to come for you because they want to make money. But what came first, the viral reposting accounts or the people? Because my thought on this is it's when your user base widens out that not only do these viral accounts understand that there is money to be made by serving you the thing that you know that you that they know that you want regardless of what platform it is, but also uh, it is the content that may not that that is more palatable for a new user that comes in the second, third, fourth, fifth, seventh, eighteenth, fiftieth wave of people that show up to something. They need something that is comforting to them because they might not be totally into everything that was happening on it before. A at a certain point, this is about welcoming in new users, and of course, I, I as as Tom pointed out here. This is probably a little bit of being upset that this culture isn't exactly what you want. You know, you, you, you can never go home again, as they say. Yeah, I mean, there, there may be just something as simple as to appeal to a mass audience, you can't be as specific. Yes. And if you want a mass audience, you're going to, you know, water down uh, the content. And if you're the person who loved the thing at the beginning when it was more specific... You're not gonna love it when it's watered down. There's that's just. Yes, yes. I don't know. It, I don't know. Uh, you know when Imagine Dragons were playing just tiny little shows, you know, in somebody's garage somewhere. But uh, you know they're enjoying a lot more success now that they have mass appeal. But those people from the early days go, eh, not the same. Yeah, exactly. Well, what are you gonna listen to your Imagine Dragons albums on, though, with Sarah? <laughs> Tom, good question. Record maker, record player maker Victrola has been in the biz for over 100 years, more recently making entry-level turntables that have built-in speakers, kind of retro designs, that type of thing. Victrola's newest item, though, is the Stream Carbon, $800 turntable that can access a Sonos system so you can stream your records in various areas of your home. Got a home, got a bunch of Sonos speakers. It would all work even if you're not near the record player itself. Once you connect everything over the Victrola Stream app, you can also control the Stream Carbon using the Sonos app itself or a control knob that's on the device. Victrola told Engadget it works with any Sonos speaker, so even if you have the older ones, that should be compatible. 
Under the hood, the Stream Carbon has a belt-driven turntable with an aluminum platter and an Ortofon 2M red cartridge, Ethernet, a built-in preamp, and RCA outputs. If you happen to have old speakers that work perfectly fine, it would work with those as well. You can pre-order the Stream Carbon now for shipment in October. I have hooked up uh, my record player to the Sonos, uh, but I had to use those RCA outputs to go into a, an amp and then out of the amp with a line out into the line in on the Sonos. And then I could only use it using the line in on the Sonos, which Sonos didn't want to leave on because it was line in. And it was like, no, oh, you want to use these other things instead, right? Uh, so I don't know that it's worth $800 to solve that, but this certainly does simplify it. And if you've seen those Victrola like suitcase looking record players, the very mm -hmm. old timey, that's not this. This is very sleek. This is very modern looking. What do you get for the hipster who has everything this yes. Christmas? It's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, my, my, my first reaction was like, I need this. Cause I, I have a lot of Sonos speakers, even though I have a pretty small house. It's like, Ooh, the idea that, you know, put, put a little something on the, on the turntable and I can hear it throughout the house. That is very attractive. $800 is, is kind of steep. Uh, Victrola did say that, uh, uh, it is working on similar type models that would be perhaps a little bit cheaper. Mm -hmm. Didn't say that specifically, but one would guess uh, because I think a lot of people are going to be like, ooh, that's that's a little steep. But hey, if you're already in the system, <laughs> if you already have Sonos speakers in your house, you're used to partying with money. So yeah. there you go. I, I, I have a friend that just bought a new house. He's got Sonos speakers and he's a gigantic vinyl head. I don't know if I love him $800 worth. <laughs> we're going to find out between now and Christmas. <laughs> uh, Larry in Atlanta says, wouldn't a Bluetooth adapter do the same thing? Um, my record player has Bluetooth in it. They, that's not the point. The point is this works with Sonos, right? You Yes, you could do line in. You could do Bluetooth. There's other ways to do it, and they're cheaper, but this is built into the system. And and again, maybe not $800 worth of convenience savings, but a, but a convenience saving. Indeed. All right, let's check out the mailbag. All right, this one comes from Suzanne. This was a Patreon message. Thank you for being a patron, Suzanne. Suzanne says, we have two HEB stores here in Austin, Texas that let you scan your stuff with an app. You just check out at a special kiosk, you scan a QR code, it sends your order to the kiosk. Usually it requires a cashier to come scan three to five random things in your basket, but it takes way less time than the regular line or the self-checkout. It's wonderful. Yeah, I've, I've, we've heard from a lot of folks who've been talking about things, uh, some of them even going back into the 90s, uh, that have done similar things to that app and scan and, and pay system. I asked Suzanne if if she knew if the one that HEB was using was the Instacart one, because they've had that uh, available for a while. Uh, but I, I haven't heard back uh, whether it is or not. You, you haven't happened to use this, have you, Justin? I have not. I've always wound up doing self-checkout at HEB, but I do know for a fact that HEB has their own tech and, and development department. So uh, it would not shock me if this technology was developed in house. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Or, or, or from some other vendor that's, that's more white label or something. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've, I've, I've spoken, I, I got into a conversation locally with, with somebody that, that works in there and uh, the way that they were describing it, that they are fairly hands-on uh, with their, 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 their tech stuff. So who knows? Meanwhile, uh, Ralph's and all you Kroger uh, associated stores out there like Ralph's uh, suffer along with me where they're like, no, we insist you use Kroger pay, which nobody Yikes. wants. In fact, I, I can't even make it work at Ralph's. So. Oh my gosh. Remember like Walgreens pay there. Everybody yeah. had to pay at one point. Yep. I mean, some of them are still, you know, going strong. Uh, well, thanks to everybody who does write in with on the ground reports. Really, really appreciate them. Also, thanks to you, Justin, Robert Young, uh, let folks know where they can keep up with the rest of your work. You can download my uh, new-ish podcast, We're Not Wrong, featuring myself, Jen Briney, and Andrew Heaton, a panel show discussing two stories each and every week. Uh, it, it's really kind of been a hit for us, and so we're, we're really, really happy that it is uh, uh, rolling along. Go find it wherever you find your podcasts. Uh, on this week's edition of the program, We Are Not Wrong, about Ron DeSantis's migrant flights and whether or not, as Joe Biden said on 60 Minutes, the pandemic is over. I uh, 
<laughs> on my editor's desk uh, for the patrons that just went out today, I, I talked about all the podcasts I subscribe to. And I talked about We're Not Wrong and how one of the things I love about it is that you all three sometimes can disagree with each other from three different methods uh, and have a rousing discussion of, of it and then just go like, all right, friends, let's go on to the next topic. It's, it's a great example for humanity, uh, if nothing else. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's fun. Well, we're not wrong, any of us. Nope. <laughs> Type thing. Special thanks to Jeremy Taran, who's one of our top lifetime supporters here on DTNS. Thank you, Jeremy, for all the years of support. Jeremy, Jeremy. Well, we know Patreon isn't broken. I was uh, I was wondering if Patreon just wasn't giving us notifications because we we we've gotten one person <laughs> deleted their account, uh, another one readjusted their account down by twenty four cents. Uh, I don't know if you were just trying to make see if the notifications work, but thanks. Uh, what would be a better test is a new patron. If you're out there and you're willing to raise your hand, step forward and say, I will become a new patron of <laughs> DTNS just to see if the notifications are broken or not. Head right now to patreon.com slash DTNS. Speaking of patrons, stick around for the extended show called Good Day Internet, where we talk about all the things. A lot of it comes from DTNS, and then we and we kind of, you know, make it free form. You can catch this show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. If you can join us live, we'd love to have you. And we'll be back tomorrow talking two-factor auth myths with Shannon Morse and Len Peralta. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>